Welcome to the Sunday Night Live Stream. I'm Bobby Burton. Uh, it is time to talk a little Longhorn sports. A lot of news going on. Congratulations, first and foremost, to Scotty Scheffler, uh, golfer, uh, University of Texas grad, uh, just won his second Masters. Uh, elite company when you do that twice, guys. Uh, congratulations to him. Also takes in a cool $3.6 million while doing so. Uh, not a bad Sunday afternoon at the at the office for him. Like, like we talked about, three point six the winning check, but he just made twenty plus in Easy. endorsements and everything. And by the way, that that punched his ticket to the World Golf Hall of Fame. He's officially now going to be a World Golf Hall of Famer. It's normally twenty wins in a major, but he's got two Masters. He's got two Players Championships, and he just stays upright for a few more years. The twenty win mark that that that's not going to mean anything. Uh, he punched his ticket to the uh, World Golf Hall of Fame today. So congrats to Scotty. That that that's that's hellacious. And mm -hmm. his uh, wife was uh, on the cusp of giving birth too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, let's, and let's he, add that to it. He, it could be. And he said he said that he would he said that he would bow out of the Masters no matter where he was in the the rankings and where he was on the leaderboard. If she went into labor, he would just leave, and that's which is which is wild. But I believe him. He's a man of principle. I do I believe him. him. I believe them. Yeah. All right. Uh, tonight's uh, live stream brought to you by our friend Joe Brown, veteran mortgage broker. Uh, I've known Joe for 20 plus years. He's been absolutely terrific and worked with me uh, multiple times. He's also, or excuse me, worked with me on my very first uh, home ever. Uh, Joe is also just a great all around guy. He's worked with several different Longhorns throughout the years. Uh, he now works with South, Southside Bank, uh, 512 663. 4744. That's 512 663 4744. He has 30 plus years of experience. When you're making a purchase that could be as big as any you ever make in your life, you want someone that's been there a long time and knows what it's all about uh, and someone you can trust. Give Joe a call 512 663 4744. Other good news outside of Scotty Shuffler, guys, uh, you know, the Longhorn baseball team, eight run ninth inning today to come back to beat uh, the Houston Cougars, win the series wow. two games to one. Uh, the Longhorns now nine and six in conference conference play, standing in fourth place solo. Uh, they uh, have a uh, matchup this coming weekend against TCU. Uh, TCU not in the top four. Uh, Longhorns uh, got a, a big matchup with Oklahoma coming in two weeks. The Sooners right now tied for first place uh, in the conference. Uh, and then also we've got some other couple other things I want to mention. Before we get going, and we're going to take y'all's questions, everything. Uh, Longhorns had a big scrimmage on Saturday as well. Uh, that uh, that uh, you know, a lot of people got a chance to see Jerry. You were there uh, watching recruits, uh, all of that stuff. Speaking of recruiting, basketball takes center stage for a little bit tonight. Jerry, I'm going to let you go over the two transfer portals the Longhorns picked up today. Yeah, they started uh, started the weekend. Uh, Cam Scott was released from his letter of intent, the uh, top 35 ranked kid in the country in 2024 20, uh, class, um, uh, despite some chatter out there that, you know, was kind of Texas didn't care if he left. That's not the case. He's a future first round pick. Uh, he's already in mock drafts. But Texas rebounded from that. Uh, and uh, Jason Kent, last year, Texas struggled because they couldn't play a big lineup with a true college wing. Jason Kent from Indiana State is a true college wing. Uh, that is, that's a good pickup for Texas. That gives them immediately uh, on the surface. Look, you got to see how the roster is built out. I mean, you can't play four on four yet, right? You got to build out your roster here. Uh, but that on the surface gives you a wing player, a true college wing player. Uh, what's really good about Jason Kent is he doesn't have to have the ball in hand to be an effective player. Really good cutter, reads the defense really well. A catch and shoot guy from three, not going to put it on the deck, uh, but a really good all around player. Doesn't force action, lets the game come to him. Just a solid, solid piece uh, for Texas. Then Tremont Mark from Dickinson, who began his career, the 6'6 lefty guard, began his career at Houston, played there a couple of years, transferred. Obviously, was at Arkansas last year. Uh, that season kind of imploded on Eric Musselman. Thus, he's at USC and John Calperi's in Fayetteville. Uh, Tremont Mark comes back home to Texas. Uh, lefty uh, guard, uh, really good in the mid-range, gets to the free throw line, which I thought is an area that uh, Texas can improve on next season. So they got some size. They got If you want to play a big lineup, uh, Texas can now play a big lineup. Uh, they couldn't really do that and be skilled last year. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so they they can play a big lineup on the surface. We need to see what happens at point guard. Uh, see how the roster comes together. You got to get two more bigs, at least one more big if Anyema stays. Uh, and that big, uh, you know, preferably a big that can help stretch the floor. Um, I think Texas is very much in on Brandon Garrison, who's not that. He's more of a back to the basket guy. Uh, but Texas will have more visitors. They'll have a uh, They'll have six, seven, eight visitors in an eight-day span and brand, ending with Brandon Garrison uh, at the spring game. That will be his visit. So uh, Texas is going to try to build this roster, and we can talk more about it when we see what it's really going to look like. But this tonight, as of tonight, Texas actually can play a big lineup if they get the pieces around these guys uh, because they have a true college wing and a 6'6 guard who can play on that wing as well. So you have two options to play a bigger lineup, which last year you did not have. Hey, Jerry, we're going to go. And softball's on a hot streak, by the way. Somebody, Cisco Diaz said that. Oh, yeah. They're they're number one in the country, aren't they? I think. They beat Baylor. Yeah. Uh, long story short, uh, we, I want to, before we go anywhere else, though, we need to go and talk a little bit more recruiting on the football side of things. Uh, the transfer portal opens on Tuesday, Rod and Jerry. Uh, so uh, April 16th to April 30th. Uh, guys can put their names in there. There's already been some guys say that they're going in. We uh, The idea that Bear Alexander out of USC kind of tinkered with the idea and then said, no, I'm staying. Uh, but news broke on Friday that Bill Norton, defensive lineman out of Arizona, uh, another defensive lineman from Arizona. Now, Texas already has one transfer from Arizona on the on the squad, and that's Tia Savea. Bill Norton, who originally signed with Georgia uh, out of, I believe, Memphis, uh, in, in Memphis, uh, uh, Tennessee, he's going to put his name in the portal, apparently. Uh, Longhorn coach Johnny Nansen, linebacker coach, uh, coached him at Arizona. Uh, so that's a name to be watching for. Isaiah Rakes, big man out of uh, uh, that played it at uh, Texas A&M last year, transferred for uh, three months or four months to USC. He also put his name in the portal. He's another defensive tackle. But look, uh, there could be other big names coming in the next 48 to 72 hours, Jerry and Rod, that actually might be big, big, big time guys. Rod, I had a question for you here. Uh, given the fact that uh, I heard some, some that the defense, particularly the interior of the defensive line, uh, the first first round or the first team guys, Vernon Broughton and Alfred Collins, did not necessarily fare well against the run on Saturday. How important do you think it is that Texas goes out and gets a big, big time guy in the portal at defensive tackle? Um, I think it could be uh, really a crucial uh, element to making the defense successful. I mean, you look at last year, right? I mean, what was the Achilles heel of the defense last year? It was pass defense. And their two losses basically came because of pass defense, right? Against Washington, against Oklahoma. Um, so if you, you know, I think if Texas wants to be able to stop the run effectively, the power run game specifically, uh, where you're talking about gap schemes, uh, power schemes, uh, and you're going to play teams like Michigan, you're going to play Georgia. And t- I think Texas, for the, even if they are weak in the interior D line, the guts of the defense, um, let's say that off ball linebacker, I think right now it, it looks like, you know, you, you have at least some options right there, but let's say that could end up being something that's uncertain. Then you're going to be susceptible to the interior runs, the power and the gap schemes right up the gut. And Michigan, Georgia, those are two teams that, that, that can specialize in power gap schemes, running downhill, playing bully ball. So for the most part, I think Texas will be fine. I think Texas could, you know, win most of their games. But if you're talking about winning a national championship, then that's a hole that you got to figure out. That's a hole right now in your roster. You don't necessarily have an answer to it. You don't have a solution on your roster to it. You may find one throughout the season, but can you take that chance going into the season without necessarily knowing that or having a known entity or having a proven commodity that can be a, a basically a stop gap right there, a, 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 a force run defender in the middle of your defense. That's going to be a problem potentially. So yeah, I, I would, I would exhaust all possible options if I was Texas to try to bring in more solutions, more possible solutions. Jerry, I, I got to ask you this. There's a difference between just more and somebody that's elite. That That's what I, I think Texas has to have someone that's truly elite, like a difference maker at that position. Because right now, I think they have guys. I'm not sure they have high draft picks. Isn't that really 
like kind of the, the crux of it. Like they have to, to Rod's point, they've got guys they can rotate and be and be okay. But if they want to be elite, they need somebody that's either stepping up to be that elite. And I did hear that Sadir Mitchell had a better uh, practice again, but he, he's still so young. Uh, so is Alex January. Uh, Jure Bledsoe, but he's more of a three technique. What, you know, what is the, what's the thought process there? It can't just be another guy. It has to be somebody that they really, really need. Yeah. I think, uh, I think two guys, I mean, that's the key, right. Is, is two players. Um, I'm not sure I'm to the point where it needs to be an absolute war daddy uh, because I think Texas is going to be better at safety. They're going to be better at edge. Um, I think they're going to be more experienced at corner um, and have a little more versatility at corner. And so I'm not – I think they've gotten better in other places. I I, I just – I don't think – look, we'll see what happens when, on Tuesday when the portal actually opens, right? Um, if one of those at true war daddy guys is going to jump in the portal. But if you got a fourth, fifth round draft pick guy that can play over the ball, I mean, with everything else that Texas has, um, unless you have a, sl a slew of injuries defensively, you're going to have enough to compete. I mean, uh, there's – I mean, look, Michigan – we're, I know we're all looking for the perfect teams, but Michigan won the national championship without a number one wide receiver last year. I mean, imagine that team if Xavier Worthy had been on it. <laughs> I mean, so there aren't really going to be perfect teams. I think Texas has to be good enough with their rotational depth is the thing for me, uh, is the, the hold up over the season. Um, so I, I'll believe it when I see a first rounder jumps into the portal. Um, I mean, but if Texas can find a, two guys who can play a gap snaps, and one of those guys is a mid to late round draft pick. Uh, Texas, I, I, I'll stand by. I think Texas will be a better team next year. Hmm. I'm just, I'm just gonna. I, my issue is this: y'all aren't wrong. I mean, I, I look at teams. These are teams that aren't considered good teams right now, but that run the ball can run the ball on the interior because they've got big dudes. Mm -hmm. Kentucky, Florida, Mississippi State. Most Texas fans right now are saying, oh, we're going to win those three games, right? I mean, they everybody is, right? Well, if you can't stop the power run in the SEC, I think it may be a little bit different than what it is when you're playing some teams in the Big 12. I just I well, just do. So Texas will play more worried. at talented offensive linemen next year as a whole. Yeah. That doesn't mean, oh, you didn't have a good line and a couple of good tackles. Kansas State didn't have a couple of good players and a really good guard, um, a couple others. But – it's a more athletic talent, longer arm guys is in the league next. The Texas yeah. is going. No, I agree with Jerry. Like I said, I think you can, you'll be fine in most of your games. There are just maybe one or two games, maybe three, where you could have a serious problem. And if teams can run the ball, that means they can control the ball, which means they can yeah. control the game. And the truth is, what you really want to do with the power running game is not necessarily you know, move the football down the field. You want to convert and control and keep the ball away from Texas' offense. That's the key. Key to beating yeah. Texas is not letting the offense get so many possessions on you. You can do that, and then that's how you, you keep the game, I think, within within range of you being able to win it in the fourth quarter against Texas and not allowing that high-powered offense to just take take off and have these stretches where they, they just are extremely prolific. And they have back to back drive, which we've seen against Texas, right? Against other teams for Texas, they've been able to separate and get big leads on them because the offense is really hard to stop when they get a lot of drives. But when you can limit the drives, which is what Washington did, controlling the ball, and they did it in a different way. But when you control yeah. the ball against Texas, it really puts them in a bind because you just limit possessions. That's any high powered offense. So that's the concern that they would turn it into an ugly game. And the, and a ball control game, which is not really the game that Sark wants to play. Sark wants to be able to have as many possessions as possible, and Sark would like a track meet and a a shootout, ideally, because he can, he loves those because he knows how to win those. If you want to turn it into ball control? That's a different game altogether. Uh, hey, Rod, I want to I want to stay with you here real quick. Speaking with Rod Babers, Jerry Hamilton, I'm Bobby Burton. This is the Sunday Night Longhorn live stream on Texas football. Uh, Rod, uh, Jerry and I and everybody I talked to uh, this over this weekend said that Quinn Ewers looked as polished and as strong and as uh, poised mm -hmm. as he's looked at any point in his career on Saturday during that scrimmage. This is not coming from just recruit. I mean, I'm telling you, like multiple people said, look, he stood in there and delivered. 
Okay. It, it, how, how big can that be for Texas? Because it, I feel like, look, I, I've said this. I think Quinn Ewers is still a work in progress, an extremely talented work in progress, right? And always has been. And so each year he gets better. He gets yes. better. He gets better. He's not a finished product. He won't no. be a finished product this year. But from what I was told yesterday, he's getting darn it. He's getting a heck of a lot closer. Yeah. Uh, and it, maybe, it, maybe it was a year ago. Yeah, and at the end of the season, he's always a lot better than he was at the beginning of the season. Yeah. I mean, you can almost see, you love that it's a linear progression with him. And each year he builds on the skill set. And I'm with you. I think this I think this season, uh, I'm expecting a breakout season. That's crazy to think because I think he's had a really successful campaign so far. But I would expect this season for him to be in the Heisman conversation, to be in the conversation to be a first round pick, but even the top quarterback taken off the board. I mean, he should be in that conversation. Not saying he's going to do it, but he should be in that conversation. If he's not in that conversation, then, you know, I think maybe he didn't necessarily have the leap that we all thought, but I, I think it's in him. I mean, I, I know it's in him. I don't think it's in him. I know it's in him. And I, the, the compatibility he has with Sark's offense, I just think now they know each other really well. He knows that offense really well. I yeah. go back to that. A uh, story that uh, I've, I always told about Tom Herman and Sam Ellinger's offense. And Tom Herman said at one point, he told me, he said, Sam Ellinger knows my offense better than I know it. He comes to me with little intricacies and little uh, details about my offense and uh, ideas and recommendations that I never thought of. And I'm like, that's actually a good idea. I don't know why I didn't think of that. Uh, but, you know, that I think that's because he now he was intimately now knowledgeable of the offense. And I think that's where Quinn is now. He should be at that point where him and Sark can discuss that offense and talk about it in almost a, a peer-to-peer format where he knows the offense really well, too. So I, I don't think that'll be a question. Now, in spring, listen, I'll just say this. He's supposed to be delivering the ball on the money. He's a he's a veteran now. He knows the offense really well. He knows nobody can touch him in the spring. Hey yeah. man, sit in that pocket and feel really good about delivering that ball on the money. <laughs> uh, but I hope he's. I hope and I, I I bet he is working on his internal clock, working on the pocket science. You know, not taking for granted that yes, he's got the green jersey on and nobody can touch him, but understanding that, feeling that pressure, knowing that even in practice, hey, you know what? In the game, that that guy's gonna ha- be able to get a hand on me. That guy's gonna come at my my legs. He's gonna dive at me. Work in the pocket science. I, I know he's doing those little things. So I'm, I'm with you, man. I think really this team goes as Quinn goes. Or that's I, I don't think this this team can come close to reaching its it's true level of, you know, the, the true level of expectations we have for it, unless Quinn takes the, takes the leap this year, that it's not possible in my opinion. I and think then, we can't, I, I think we can't say enough, by the way. I, and I know it was on air, but what he did at the in Texas pro day, that gives so a guy good. a lot of confidence guys. Yeah. I mean, we, we talk about it. We just talked about Scotty Shuffler, but that's the only time, a football player lives a PGA Tour life as a pro golfer. You're out there. Everybody's watching you. Everything that you do, no helmet, no lineman, no team around you. It's you. And you threw 100 footballs, well, it's threw 70, 75 balls that day, threw one bad ball. That does a hell of a lot for your confidence. It, should. Yeah, it, it really does. I, I was there that day, Jerry, and I could yeah. not agree with agree, agree more with you. He, he took that in stride, and, and I think he's building on it uh, for this uh, this year. Hey, I want to I want to mention this. Uh, we've already talked. Uh, a lot of people have joined us either uh, on uh, YouTube, on Twitter, wherever. Uh, I want to mention we've already talked about Scotty Scheffler winning the Masters. Congratulations to the Dallas native, native and former Longhorn uh, winning his second Masters. I uh, talked about the Longhorn baseball ten- team winning, uh, coming back uh, with an eight-run ninth inning against U of H down in Houston. Uh, earlier today to win that series. Uh, then also, uh, Texas Longhorn basketball picks up two commitments, uh, guard out of Indiana State and a guard wing out of uh, Arkansas, uh, both come into the Longhorns uh, now as well. And now we're going to talk a little recruiting uh, in football as well. Jerry, you had something you wanted to say there? Well, yeah, uh, congratulations to UT boy on Jonte's touchdown in the uh, scrimmage Saturday. I know he, that's big for him. I see him on I see him on the chat, so we need to get that out of the way. Yep, there it is. Uh, so, all right. Uh, but, hey, recruiting-wise on nontexasfootball.com. And, uh, man, hey, not a better time to be an OG. 
an OTFOG guys. Right, I put man. out the uh, spring game uh, key visitor list uh, today. Uh, we, we obviously we have a lot of stuff from the weekend that CJ Vogel and myself have put out. Um, we're going to have more on that uh, tomorrow. Uh, but the spring game uh, visitor list, and it's a partial list, but it's the key guys to know right now. And a little interesting thing on Sunday, I put it in the thread, but if you haven't read that thread, um, I, yeah, I think there's a 65, 60, 40, 65, 35 uh, shot that Kelshawn Johnson and his mom uh, come up to Austin Saturday as well. He has regional track meet um, this weekend. A lot of guys do that. will keep Nick Townsend from coming up this weekend. That'll keep DeCorey and Moore, some of those guys from being at the spring game. But uh, I'm not sure uh, that Kelshawn won't be there um, with his mom because his mom couldn't make it uh, April 6th. So uh, we'll, we'll see. I think we'll keep adding pieces to that. Uh, one of the big things that came out of the Saturday for me, and I think CJ would say the same thing, is uh, we were interviewing Jackson Christian. Uh, the media was interviewing Jackson Christian, and he was on campus with his mom Saturday, the offensive lineman out of Port Natchez Groves on Texas f- uh, football, four-star lineman. Um, there at PNG, and he said, "I'm gonna, coming back Tuesday." And I, I was kind of like, "Okay, that's a quick turnaround, man." It's a lot. Of, I mean, that's a long drive from Port Natchez. I'm sure some people have made it, especially if I ten shut down. Um, so <laughs> that's a long drive uh, from Port Natchez to Austin, and you're going to make that two times in five days. So just something that we're going to keep an eye on there. Uh, you know what? It's something similar to what Elijah Bo Barnes did. Yeah. He came in last weekend, then came in again, kind of made a surprise visit on Friday, and then ended up committing to the Longhorns on Friday afternoon, the linebacker out of Dallas Skyline. Uh, Repeat visits in a quick nature, Rod Babers. You've been a recruit. Mm -hmm. What do you think that means? Is that that like a circle star? You think maybe something's going on there? No, you know it's just like when you go on a date and then she wants to see you again like the next (laughs) day, right? She's like, hey, can I I see you again? She's hitting you up. You're like, all right, well – you know what? I really liked her. I might, I'm, I'm gonna make this thing happen. And so that, I think that's kind of what it, what it feels like to me. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's a good way to put it. It really is. Rod, Rod has a way now. Uh, yeah. Jerry, uh, other guys, mostly uh, there was Caleb Chesterham from Fort Ben Marshall. Yeah. Uh, he had been offered. Who are the? What, there's one other guy that had been offered. Keati Armstrong, 2025 recruit. Keati Armstrong, tied in from uh, Jasper, was on campus with his father. A couple other family members. That's an AM Texas battle. I won't totally rule out LSU, uh, but really AM in Texas. He's been on campus at AM more than he has Texas. Obviously, very close to Ty Anthony Smith, Texas freshman linebacker who flipped from AM. Also tight with a lot of those uh, 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 Golden Triangle area guys. Um, there's a few of those guys at Texas, the Jalen Gilbos of the world. Um, but yeah, Keati Armstrong was, he was on campus with his father. Um, obviously, Bobby. Something you'll really like. His father uh, is uh, related to the Armstrongs, the fast track guys out of Jasper that were, I think one was an Olympian, national champion. I mean, so Jasper through and through, his dad played. His dad graduated from Jasper around the same time that uh, Jory Adams and Red Bryant did, uh, for the record. So they were on the same Jasper Bulldogs team together. I think Texas and A&M are going to battle out there for Armstrong. I think he really likes the offensive scheme. Uh, at Texas and uh, kind of the way the tech, obviously the way the tight ends are used at, at Texas. We'll see what happens. Texas has four tight ends scheduled for official visits. They'll walk away with two of those guys. I'm, I'll be, I'll be shocked if they don't. Um, so I think Texas is going to have a really good run at tight end. Um, then the other uh, key couple of guys to mention were 26s for me. Um, Ty, Tyon King, linebacker from Port Arthur Memorial, who Texas offered last week. He immediately got to Austin um, with his mom, a couple of family members. Uh, a guy that's really close with Jalen Gilbo. There he is, uh, close with Jalen Gilbo, one of the top linebackers in the country in 2026. Close with Gilbo, close with Ty Anthony Smith. They work out with some of the same people there. So I think that was a really big offer um, uh, for Tyon King, uh, the Texas offer. a and was out in front of that. They've been on him a long time. I think Choke transitioning to Nansen. Nansen uh, really liked uh, Tyon King and they extended that offer. And then uh, Toa Katoa, offensive lineman from Euless Trinity. Uh, and, and look, that recruitment will play out a little bit. I, Texas would take the commitment today. He actually weighed in at 366 Saturday because he's been listed at 385 by some people, but he, he came in at 366. I think that's kind of, he'll, he'll be in that 360, 370 range in high school. I kind of think that's what he has been. One of the best offensive guard prospects in the country in 26. Jerry, it was, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, it's been a long time since I've been down there, but it, Back in the 80s or 90s, I think it was the 90s, because I, I went by the school. 
can't even remember whether it was Jasper or Silsby that won the straight, state track title. Jasper. But they didn't have a track. That's Jasper. They had a dirt track. <laughs> Just, wow. they, Rod, they did not have a track at the school at the time. I they know. Won, they won the state title. <laughs> they were blazing, blazing fast, playing. In the, they were in the 3A level, and then they just blew everybody away. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> that is. I mean, they had multiple national champions. A couple, I think, maybe two guys that ran in the Olympics. At least one. I mean, wow. they had a run there. Uh, unbelievable speed from <laughs> Jasper in about a decade, fifteen-year period of time. Dude, that should be a thirty for thirty. That's crazy. <laughs> hey, if you can run, you don't need a, you don't need a you don't need an oval. You just go. <laughs> what I say, what do I say, Rod? Roll out of bed and run four four. Yeah, they had about, man. They had about six guys that could do that. <laughs> <laughs> man, that is crazy. That's wild. Right. That's good story. Hey, we're gonna. It's a Sunday night live stream. We're gonna take y'all's questions. Just kind of chit chat, uh, talk about whatever y'all want to talk about in the chat. Uh, take questions yeah. on recruiting the team, what we saw uh, or what we heard. Excuse me uh, from Saturday's scrimmage. Uh, uh, anything and everything is uh, up for debate. The, the portal's getting ready to open in two days uh, as well. Uh, but before we do that, I want to tell you all about some events we have coming up. Obviously, the spring game is in six days. Uh, we are going to be down. I'm going to be in Austin all week. I go, I'm go. i going to be in Austin starting tomorrow. Uh, on Wednesday, we have a get-together at the Posse East. If you're in town, come out from like 3 to 5, 30 or 6. Uh, me, Rod, Jerry, hopefully be, be able to make it as well. CJ will be there. I'm buying the first drink uh, for folks. First beer. <laughs> Let's be clear uh, for folks uh, just as a thank you. For you yeah. yeah. Be clear. And then uh, Saturday, uh, we're going to be actually at the uh, spring game, obviously. Uh, but Rod and I will be doing a pregame at the Victory Lap, which is a uh, uh, place near campus, right across from the Castilian. Uh, oh, yeah. If you're familiar with campus, it used, where, you, where Mad Dog and Beans used to be is now there. Uh, we're going to be there from 11 to 12 on Saturday. Our producer, Matt, will be there as well. You'll get to say hey to him, uh, too. But please join us if you would. We're going to have a little fun, uh, try to chill out, uh, enjoy seeing our Longhorns uh, for the first time since uh, the Sugar Bowl on January 1. Everybody get a chance to see a lot of these new guys. Uh, Jerry, speaking of new guys, Rod, speaking of new guys, uh, Ryan Wingo has gotten a lot of pub. Wow. And right, rightfully so uh, to this point in spring practice. But the freshman that we heard the most of and most from about on Saturday was actually Colin Simmons. Yeah. Uh, Simmons had two sacks the previous Saturday. He got in the backfield early and often this Saturday as well, uh, along with Trey Moore. Uh, I think that the Longhorns are looking at a better group of pass rushers overall in 2024. Yeah, I, I so look, I, I know Rod, we had a discussion on Friday about this, but let's go again. Um, it, it, for me, Texas has to get the quarterback on the ground more. That's the next step you have to take, right? Um, and I'm not knocking the PFF, you know, numbers. I mean, they're fine to talk about, right? Uh, but Texas has to get the quarterback on the ground more. They have to change mm -hmm. second and longs more, third and longs more. They have to get teams out of rhythm more than just getting pressures. You got to get on quarterback. You got to get quarterback to the ground. Um, and, and I do think Trey Moore and Colin Simmons, along with Burke being a third year player, Baron Sorrell coming back another year. Uh, I think Texas has Anthony Hills, a second year player. I think te Texas has a lot more pass rush capability where teams aren't just going to be able to slide prop pocket on Texas. I, I think Texas is going to be able to get more hits on the quarterback this year. And what does that do? You can play more aggressive with your corners. You got better safety speed and that better safeties over the top. I think the whole thing, the whole defense rod, maybe minus Jalen Ford, maybe put together a little bit better uh, in, in some manner as far as being able to be more multiple this year. Yeah, um, I, I agree with you. I mean, it, it does kind of feel like, like I said, I, I was on a defense at Texas that lost Sean Rogers and Casey Hampton um early on i was a sophomore and we lost those guys after 2000 and it was a trend it was a it, we still were really good i think we were a top 10 defense yeah. still but it was a different style of defense we you know Corey redding's presence he stepped up we played we were a defense that was built more 
from the the back end, the back seven up. We didn't have the presence in the interior D-line, but we started to have guys who were better on the edges, better. Those Texas City linebackers were stepping up. Remember those guys? Yes. Eric Rawls or Tyrone Jones. Or, you know, we had those guys. We had Corey Redding stepping up, like I said. You know, we had uh, myself and uh, uh, Nathan Basher. So it was just a different defense. So I, I, th- I think this defense actually kind of reminds me of it. We have a lot of young secondary guys. Guys who are ready to step up. Malik Muhammad's ready to step up. They brought in Makuba, but Jade Barron's ready to have. I mean, he's already had some great seasons, but ready to have potentially his best season. Terrence Brooks, uh, the linebacker, and obviously Anthony Hill's ready to take on a huge role with this defense. So I think your strengths are just going to be at different places on the defense rather than where it was, obviously, in your front seven, specifically in the interior, the guts, Jalen Ford, and, you know, Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat. That's, that was the core of the defense. That's why your rush defense was so uh, so great and so elite. Um, I, so I think you'll have still some elite um, assets uh, within this defense. I just don't know if they'll be the same as last season. Right. I just think it may be it may be coverage. It may be uh, still on third down, still specifically situationally in red zone. I just think you'll do it in a different way because you just won't have the strengths in the interior. You'll have the strengths problem, I, I hope, in the back seven. And that's how you can kind of construct the game plans going forward. So it's going to be interesting. And the, the edges, right? The edges, just like for us, when Corey Redding became, you know, a, a, a really good player for us on the edges, I think it was Kalen Thornton was on the edge for us. He was a really reliable player and a veteran. You know, that's where we became a different defense, but it was constructed from the outside in. I feel like that's what this defense is going to be if the, you know, the interior isn't going to be a strength, which I don't suspect it's going to be. Not saying it'll be a weakness. But just saying, I don't know if it'll be the dominant presence it was last season. That This brings us to a great question. And thank you, Aloha Traveler, for the super chat. Uh, Aloha, fellas, and hook them, Scheffler. Uh, Scotty went in the Masters today. And here's the 50K subs on On Texas Football. We're at 41.9 uh, right now. So it's uh, been a uh, long stretch of a uh, run up here. What are the missing pieces? Aloha Traveler wants to know. What are the missing pieces on this team this year and next year? So think about that from keeping Texas from winning a national championship. They should be in really good shape this year and next year just based on what we know. I mean, look, they're going to be good on the offensive line again next year. Mm-hmm. So I, I hear what this. I hear what he's saying this year and next year. I think the interior defensive line is this year's issue, if you're asking me. Yep. Okay, if you can address that and get the receivers up to speed with Quinn, at least so they're a reasonable approximation of what they did last year, that's this year's issue for me. Next year, I don't know, Arch Manning being re- really ready to go may be it. Because, I mean, they, they should be loaded next year too, guys. It, it's, it's hard to even talk about two years out because of the portal, right? I mean, that's, a, that's yeah. so difficult. Um, and you're getting to the point where you're going to have eight, nine draft picks a year. That that gets difficult for me. Um, I, I would say this year, look, I think um, I, I'm i a big I, – I, people say you just jinx things, but, you know, you got to stay healthy at about four positions, really. And, and quarterbacks are given, but left tackle, right? Mm-hmm. Kelvin Banks has been a pretty healthy player. You got to stay healthy there. Uh, your, your pass rush guys have to stay healthy because I do think that Texas is going to take a step there. Um, and then uh, Malik Muhammad. He's got to stay healthy. Um, uh, Rod, Manny had a pick Saturday. He's having a great spring. Oh, yeah, uh, even fighting through the little the, the minor hamstring tweak, he's having a great, not good, great spring yeah. uh, from all accounts. So, I um, mean, I think staying healthy at a few positions. Obviously, D-line, if, you're, if we're looking for the perfect team, interior D-line, you'd like to get a couple of guys out of the portal that have played uh, a couple hundred snaps in the A-gap um, that you know can come in. And it, even if they're undrafted free agent guys or a sixth-round pick guy or fifth-round pick guy, that guy's going to be uh, – uh, he's going to help immensely this year. Uh, but I, I really think with this group, guys, I mean, I'll, I'll say the other one is health at tight end. Uh, because I'm still not sure, and I'm as bad as the, it looked defensively against OU, if JT Sanders was healthy for the, for the Oklahoma game, I'm still not sure Texas loses that game. Well, they almost won it, regardless. Like yeah, that's yeah. a big loss in, the, in Sark's offense when JT can't do anything. He's out yeah. there limping around. Yeah, um, Nye Black needs to learn the offense a little bit better. I'm told. 
But Gunnar Helms ready to go. They should be good by the time the season run, rolls around at tight end. Tight end is not the same situation as defensive tackle, where I don't know that anybody's coming along fast enough to really amp that up. Whereas Nye Black, I think, can amp it up a little bit, yeah. right? That's that's the question I have a little bit there. Uh, Kelly at Horns, we haven't actually addressed this too much yet. Uh, asked, joined a little late, uh, but interested in the other Arizona DT entering the portal. Uh, rumors are to Texas. That's uh, Bill Norton, defensive tackle. Yes, we've heard those rumors. Uh, Johnny Nansen uh, coached him uh, at Arizona. Uh, Texas already has one defensive tackle uh, from uh, Arizona, and that's uh, Tia Savea. They could very well have a second. Uh, is my understanding. Now, he does not enter the portal officially, even though he's announced that he's going in until April 16th. Okay, that's Tuesday. Um, given that, you know, I'm going to be a little, I think it's smart to be cautious on this because, look, we got uh, some people excited about Bear Alexander a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and then he turned around and said he's staying the next day. So you got to be a little cautious. But yes, I think that uh, if Texas is taking two, I think that uh, Bill Norton very well uh, could be one of those guys. There's some others that have gone in the portal recently. Jermaine Lowell uh, recently went in the portal from uh, LSU. Isaiah Rakes at uh, or LSU from Louisville. Uh, Isaiah Rakes from USC went in the portal. There will be more. Uh, there will be more. Last year, not many big time or not even, not many defensive tackles good enough went into the portal. In fact, just one really that people really, really wanted, and that was Brandon Fisk that went to Florida State uh, and is now going to be a top-round draft pick as well. So, yes, uh, we're, we're looking forward to that, Kelly. That's all we're waiting I'll, on. I'll, I'll, I'll continue to say this too, guys. <clears throat> and when a guy enters the portal, there's a box he can check, which is the no-contact box. That means he already knows where he's going. If somebody checks that box and it's a name we're hearing about, that's good news. If the guy, even if it's a name we're hearing a lot about, and he doesn't check that box, I mean, game on for everybody else. Mm. Players have options when they enter the portal. Yeah. Okay. Let's go this way. Should uh, This from Freelance Society. Thank you for the super chat. Should Sark be under a lot of pressure to beat OU this year? How does Texas match up with them? Sark right now one and two against the Sooners. Uh, Rod, I'm going to leave that to you to start. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the assumption is that we probably shouldn't safely assume that the Texas Longhorns are going to beat Oklahoma because it's a rivalry game. But they're replacing a lot. They're replacing, you know, both coordinators, uh, damn near the entire uh, starting offensive line, um, from what the reports are. They'll have a new starting quarterback too. Uh, that's a lot uh, to replace going into a tougher conference like the SEC. So, they'll, you know, I don't, I'm trying to think about how many SEC games they play before they play Texas. Obviously, they play them early on there in October, but they're replacing a lot over the offseason. So I think the assumption is that Texas should have the advantage in most of the matchups position wise against Oklahoma. But y'all know that usually don't matter because it's Oklahoma, it's Texas OU, and anything could happen. So, yeah, uh, that's that's a game you got to be concerned about. I mean, you got to beat Oklahoma. Hell, as Mac Brown knows that very well. You can win nine, ten games if you ain't beating Oklahoma. If you ain't beating your rival, ask Ryan Day, all right, how unhappy your fan base is, no matter how, game, how many games you win. So, yes, he is under a lot of pressure to beat Oklahoma because every coach at Texas is under a lot of pressure to beat Oklahoma, period. <laughs> I, oh, wow. There's a stat. Texas 8 and 17 since 2000 against OU. There you go. Not, not a pretty stat. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. You, you under a lot of pressure to beat up. You always, that's, and now you got AM on that too. So your two main rivals, you always got to, under a lot of pressure to beat them. When Matt Brown was recruiting me, he would say, Wait, hey, you got to beat Oklahoma. We got to beat AM. You got to beat them both. That's part of it. That's part of the deal. Yeah. All right, he, that's part of the recruiting pitch. Like you beating them two schools in case we recruiting against them, just so you know you come in here to beat them. So ain't no, you know, what I mean, no soft feelings or any sensibility. No, 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 man. You gotta have that kind of instilled and programmed in. So yeah, that that, that comes without saying for Sark, he's under a lot of pressure. If he let's say he loses to Oklahoma like he did this past season, um, it could because you know that's a big game. It can end up costing you down the line. I think ultimately, you know, it didn't cost Texas as much because they still went to the Big 12 title game and won the Big 12 title game, played in the college football playoff. But if Oklahoma's handling their business, which we don't, we'll, we'll see about that with Brent Venables, 
that that's always a game that should determine national championship, you know, your, your national championship contention. But I will say it's different now because the college football playoff has expanded. So it used to mean more. I don't know if it'll mean as much in terms of the national title implications because you do get 12 teams in the playoff. Now. All right. Uh, that's Rod Babers, Jerry Hamilton. I'm Bobby Burton. Uh, let's talk a little bit about our sponsor for Sunday night's live stream. Special thanks to Joe Brown, your veteran mortgage professional with more than three decades experience uh, providing mortgages in Austin and around the state of Texas. Uh, Joe is how countless people uh, start their uh, home buying experience off the right way, uh, making sure that all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed on that mortgage. Uh, Joe actually is also a proud Navy veteran. He also has two degrees from the University of Texas as an absolutely devout Longhorn fan. Give him a call, 512-663-4744. If you're looking for a mortgage, that's 512-663-4744. Thank you, Joe, for your sponsorship of On Texas Football. Give him a shout if you're looking to buy a house and need to get a loan and set up a mortgage to do so. All right, uh, let's go around the clock here. We got some uh, more news and notes to go around and talk a little bit about. Pretty big day for the Longhorns. Uh, if you're a golf fan at all, Scotty Scheffler wins the Masters, his second. Uh, Longhorns come back, eight, score eight runs on sat on Sunday afternoon against Houston in the ninth inning, top of the ninth. They were down eight to five. They end up winning 13 to eight over the Cougars. Uh, then you have also have the Longhorns picking up two basketball commitments uh, on the day, a young man out of Indiana State and one from Arkansas. Jerry, I'm going to start with those two and ask you to give folks. We've had a, about a thousand people on Twitter join us in the last, uh, I don't know, uh, 30 minutes. Give people an update on those two young men that have committed to Texas, the basketball players. Yeah, uh, we'll start with a uh, bad, a little rough news at the start. Cam Scott, top 35 guy in the country that signed with Texas. He, he requested a release from his in, uh, national letter of intent, which Texas, I mean, you can't hold those guys to those anymore. You saw it with DeAndre Robinson. Uh, so Cam Scott is, is moved on, um, which, look, there's a lot of conjecture out there. Uh, Texas didn't care, whatever. You don't want to lose first-round picks, bottom line. Um, so, But Texas rebounded really well. What I like about what they did with Jason Kent, in particular Indiana State, is last year we talked about when Texas tried to go to a big lineup, they could not do that offensively at all. You didn't. They were playing three on five essentially. Dylan Mitchell was not a college wing. Brock or, nor Dylan Mitchell would, could put the ball on the floor at the wing position and really stress your defense. P, that Texas did not have ideal spacing in their big lineup last year. Today they got a couple of players. Uh, Tremont Mark, the other six six lefty guard uh, from Dickinson, Houston, Arkansas, now Texas. That's current uh, college basketball and college athletics, right? Uh, but they have two bigger guards. Uh, Jason Kent's more of a wing forward. That Texas has offensive skill that they can when they play a bigger lineup. They just didn't have that last year. So from a versatility standpoint, today was a really good day. What does it mean? The grand scheme of things, Texas has a lot of work to do to put the pieces together. Uh, so that's the thing. I don't want to get ahead of myself. People, sorry. Oh, this this means this. And I guess who's going to be a point guard, right? You guys see the other bigs are going to be out of the portal, and kind of the rest of this team, how it's going to come together. But what Texas did today was they got better on the wing offensively, which they did not have last year. So they suddenly will be able to play a big lineup, depending on how the rest of the pieces come together. Got it. Um, hey, a uh, couple of questions. We're just going to start hitting some uh, questions here in the chat. Uh, Daniel Lovell wants to know, you have to pay to go to this ring game, he asks. No, you do not. It is Wait, free. And guess what? I want to say this. If you haven't been to a Texas game, they're going to do a full thing uh, on Bevo Boulevard on Saturday. Nice. So go out there early and check it out. Uh, Chris Del Conte and his folks at the athletic department have made that a real carnival-like atmosphere. A lot of fun for the fans. Uh, make sure you check those out. If you're not over at the, the victory lap with me and Rod uh, talking a little Longhorn football ahead of time. Brandon Ralston, Jerry, this one's for you. It's Super Chat. Defensive players. We need to be watching in 2026. Obviously, that's way ways away. But I will ask you this. There's a, one other question that I want to uh, kind of bring into uh, this, and that's two big defensive linemen in 2026, uh, Jakeem Stewart and Tiki Hola. Uh, Hola out of Bastrop, Stewart, nationally ranked recruit. 
Yeah, so uh, on the D-line guys, I mean, Jakeem Stewart out of St. Aug is some people I'm ranked number one in the country. I went and saw him earlier this year. I think he's a top 20 kid in the country for sure. Um, look, that, that'll that be a tough one. Everybody's in on that, including LSU. So we'll, we'll, we'll have to see on that. Um, and look, the reality with the 26, anytime anybody's asking about 26 D linemen, Kenny Baker hasn't seen one. I mean, he gets to go out and see these guys for the first time and play, practice in person, a lot of these guys in May. So, uh, but I'll say this defensively, Isaiah Williams, the safety at Fort Bend Marshall, you won't find many better than him in the country in 26. He is elite elite talent for me he's been on campus twice before i think it's gonna be a really strong offensive line year in texas obviously uh isaiah williams if you're looking at one guy out there uh that was obviously kevin ford at duncanville edge guy as well um but if you're looking at one guy that says okay when i saw a guy play this year and i said the best compliment i can give a kid is that's what alabama and georgia have been playing with the last decade that's isaiah williams at fort ben marshall that's like the best compliment I could give a young kid. Yeah. Is they, that's what those guys look like at a young age when I saw them. Isaiah Williams is really, really good. Somebody asked if her, uh, Stewart might reclassify to 2025. Very academic-minded kid. Very smart kid. Interesting. All right, uh, going to stick with you here a little bit. Uh, you and Rod uh, on this one. With 2025 and 26 uh, recruits watching spring practices and scrimmage, is the performance of Arch – actually more important in spring than Quinn for recruiting. Uh, this is from Kevin Zamza. I want to start with this, Rod. Uh, I heard that uh, Arch would, did not have his best day on Saturday. Now, let's put that in context. The first seven offensive linemen did not play with the second team. And the second team, OL, that, that was linemen 8 through 13, really, kind of got overwhelmed by Colin Simmons and Trey Moore that combo. Okay. And so Arch was running for his life all day long. Right. Um, but at the same time, I was told he's holding on to the ball too long, not checking down when he had an opportunity to, he was, he, he, he was a little overwhelmed at times. It sounded yeah. like, um, how important is it for a recruit? If you're on the sidelines and you're seeing the future quarterback and say, well, wait a minute, he doesn't look as sharp as his number one ranking today. Or is that just a situation where everybody knows he's playing with the backups and it looks a little different? I think it may have a more of an impression on the wide receivers, you know, maybe because maybe they're looking at, I think for most of the guys, they're paying attention to the competition and the energy level at practice yes. vibe of the practice. Right. I mean, the coaching, right. Other coaches, like how they're coaching the players, how hard they're coaching the players, you know, are they coaching them up? That type of stuff like that. And are the players receptive to, I think they're, I think that's more what I would be paying attention to. Um, but yeah, I mean, it matters if you're the quarter, if the, the guy that's supposed to be the prince that was promised, if he doesn't look great, I'm sure that stands out to him. But I think most of the guys, like I said, I think it's a vibe and an energy level at practice. And you're, yeah. and you're specifically looking at your position. Like I know I'd be like, I'm all about the DBs, man. I'm looking at these DBs and how the DB coaches are talking to the DBs. Like what's the vibe, like how are the DBs, like how are they as a group? What's the camaraderie with the group? Right? Are they close? Are they, you know, is there a brotherhood there? Like, are they competing? You know, but so like that's the kind of stuff that would matter more to me than you know, if because listen, I'm a DV. You know, if the DVs are playing well, then of course, you know, Arch can't be balling. So I mean, practice is one of those things where I think it's it, it all depends on your perspective and your view. Right? It's a glass half full, glass half empty kind of thing. You can be like, oh man, offense look great, and then what happens to the defense? So I think it's all about what you came to practice to watch. And if they came to practice to watch Arch, then, yeah, they probably were taken aback by how disappointing uh, his performance was. But if they came to practice to watch the, the edge guys or then they probably were like really hype, you know, if they were watching those guys. So it depends on your position. I think it's all about who was there watching practice. But receivers, that is a different thing. But they could also be pretty hyped up about what they saw from Quinn and, you know, Quinn as a starting quarterback. And maybe Quinn looked like, you know, Arch when he first got to Texas. And didn't look like the Quinn after three years in the same system. So it should be a nuanced op uh, opinion. But, I may, you know, maybe some guys don't have that. I talked to one person about it, and they said, look, I mean, he's got to learn. The, the issue with Arch is, is real simple. I mean, even if you're playing with the backups, you're going to be playing in your offensive line 
you're going to be playing against teams that will over, overwhelm your first team offensive line at times. They can. So you got to learn to play against adversity no matter where you're at. And that's what they thought Sark was trying to coach out of uh, Quinn and get to him uh, on Saturday. Uh, and, or not Quinn, um, excuse me, uh, Arch. So that's good stuff. I mean, I, I think it's just part, having go, gone to Texas and watched every practice at Texas uh, when I was working for the Longhorns for three years or three and a half years, there, there are ebbs and flows to practices and to quarterbacks and to positions. Yeah. Some guys have bad days. Some, yeah. days. some days guys will have a great day and then not show up for three weeks. Uh, back in my day, I had, we had a couple of those guys that would look great on one day, and then you didn't, they didn't catch a ball for three weeks. Um, <laughs> and so I don't think that, that there's anything wrong here. It's just something that we're going to track. It's the maturity process of a position that is as important as any on the field. Uh, hey, Cisco Diaz has a question real quick. Jerry, you can get this one in. Uh, will we see who will have the green dot on Saturday? Obviously, it's going to be the quarterback on offense. On defense, Jerry, Sark has, has not really committed to any one person. Well, look, I I, I want to start this by saying I could have missed the comment or, or could have missed the uh, I've been busy with recruiting stuff. I, I don't know if you can wear it in the spring game Saturday. I don't I don't know that answer. That's the, that I haven't seen that. That somebody might have seen that. I I could have missed it. I was on the road. Um, so that's the first question is you can could you practice with it and get accustomed to him? but did not wear it in a spring game. I don't know. I was on the roof, so I didn't see any spring games. Uh, like LJ, why well, would I bring his question up? So I don't know about that. But if they can wear it, obviously your quarterbacks are going to have it. Uh, defensively, Anthony Hill said it last week. Nobody's had it yet on defense. So that might they might not have that for the spring game. That might be more of an August thing for the Texas defense. That's good. Yeah. That's, that's a good thought. I, I hadn't even <laughs> thought about that. A football junkie asks us, do you think they'll go live the whole scrimmage? I do. Um, the real question for me is how many series does Quinn really take, right? How many snaps he going to get? How many snaps Kelvin Banks going to get? Exactly. Yeah, you go. <laughs> how many snaps are some guys that you may not want to get dinged yeah. up going to take, right? Yeah. That's that, – what well, well, so, so, I do well, think they'll go live the whole scrimmage. I'll add that. And other than the start of it. Yeah, I think they'll go live the whole time. Yeah, wow, for Jerry. sure. For sure. Look, I mean, there was somebody, and when I said talked about health of key guys, somebody kind of like, well, health's a given. Yeah, but not every player is the same. <laughs> I mean, so there's certain mm -hmm. guys that can't get hurt, even if you have depth. I mean, so to your point, like how many plays is Kelvin Banks going to actually play? I mean, how, how many plays um, is, I mean, Manny Muhammad actually going to play because he's had the bit of the hamstring this mm -hmm. spring? You have to, you do have to protect some of your guys. I mean, Rod, how many how many plays did uh, Ricky, I mean, are some of those guys play in the spring game? I mean, well, you couldn't even hit Ricky. You weren't there, but you couldn't even hit him, right? <laughs> B, no, said B was like that. Said Benson had that. We, yeah. we didn't, said B, he didn't play much in the damn spring game. I don't, I think there were times, honestly, he was probably in his just jersey, probably by the, the fourth series or something like that. I mean, some guy, Roy Williams was like that. You didn't see much of Roy Williams in the spring game. You might have saw a series or two. I, right, B, I, I remember that because I remember complaining like, hey, man, why don't I get that status? When am I going to get the status where I only play two, you know, series in a spring game? But no, Rod B, I was, a, I was being considered a blue-collar guy. I was out there working, doing some special team stuff. But, yeah, there were certain guys, they, I mean, they were just, they were, they were considered, you had already seen enough. You don't need to see anything from them. And I, I totally understand it. Now I, it, I get it even more. Um, so yeah, Texas, they, they should have those guys. I'm Jade Barron. I don't know. There may be some guys we like, no, we've seen enough of you. We get it. I want to see some, and it's more sometimes it's more about let's see some exactly. of these younger guys in you know close to game time situations. Let's see how they perform. And now you have an opportunity to, to give those guys reps. So sometimes it's about seeing what you can get from the, the guys who are considered backups in the second and third string guys more so than the first string guys because you, you've already seen them for three years. I mean. You you already you got you got tons of sample size to know what Jade Barron can do for you. Why the hell do you need to see him in the spring game for five series? Like, well, and, and, and two things to that, Rod. Sark already said in his February press conference we've referenced a few times. Depth is more crucial than ever, and building that depth is more crucial than ever because if you're at Texas, you're planning for a longer season with a 12 team playoff with the expectations you have at Texas than prior. So and look, here's the difference between spring games now 
and even five years ago, 17 of 22 guys are already here of the signing class are already here. Yeah. Seven players in the portal are already here. I mean, Texas has more players they actually have to get a look at and want to put in real situations. Five years ago, that number was shrunk by about 12 to 13. Great point. Yeah. And, and by the way, those freshmen, Rod, you know this, it doesn't matter. Everybody has expectations to play. And one way is that those kids get some time in the spring game, right? That's the first step in that. Uh, those kids have worked hard. They get a lot of uh, time in the spring game. And Texas staff gets a lot of looks at those guys because – I, I don't know. I mean, Rod may have a different opinion than I, but let's just talk about uh, Phil Simi, Ryan Wingo, Jordan Johnson Bells, um, Colin Simmons, right? Oh, Colin Simmons seems to be just a gamer, gamer guy, like he always has been. But practice and scrimmages are different from spring game with 60,000 people there. Yep. It's a different look at these young guys. Mm -hmm. Yep. Totally agree. You want to see if they're going to have the same uh, mental approach to the game. You know, there's the process before the game, right? And they they got to deal with that walking into the stadium. And I'm sure there's going to be some type of uh, celebration beforehand with the players. And for the young guys, yes, it's interesting to see how they adapt to that. And if they can still, with all the hype and the pump and the circumstance and all that, still go out there and be able to execute and be able to um, go through their assignment, their alignment, and 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 go about it in the right way, and, and still perfect the method. So I agree with Jerry. I mean, I would guys I've seen for two, three years on the forty acres. I don't like Baron Sorrell is another guy. Yeah, I mean, I've seen you, Baron. I, I've, I know what you can do, brother. I, and I got trust in it already. I don't need to see it. I need to see some of these young bucks and see what they can do in that situation. I've seen you play against Alabama and Oklahoma. Like you're good. <laughs> right. And so I, I think there'll be some guys that not many guys, but I think there'll be some guys on that list where uh, you're a two or three series guy in the spring game. After that, I mean, we're moving on. We want to see these young guys perform. Not OK against Oklahoma last year, by the way. But that's a different story. <laughs> hey, hey, Bobby, no, somebody, I mean, I'm not talking about Barron Farrell. I'm talking about everybody on the defense. I feel so, that's fair. Just to be clear. But uh, somebody, against Alabama, somebody, yes. asked, somebody asked specifically about the portal. It opens Tuesday. So 11.59 p.m. Monday night, once that clock hits Tuesday, April 16th, portal officially opens. And, yes, we'll have a portal thread on OTF for the person that asks. And we're waiting to hear. There are some guys that have entered the portal or that are saying they're entering the right. portal that we believe Texas will have interest in. We talked about them a little bit. Bill Norton, defensive tackle out of Arizona, was uh, played for Johnny Nansen at Arizona. Texas already grabbed one Arizona defensive tackle and Tia Savea. We think Texas is going to go after two defensive tackles in the portal. Bill Norton could be one. Other guys that went in or that are saying they're going in, uh, Isaiah Rakes out of USC uh, that by way of Texas A&M, and then also uh, Jermaine Lowell uh, out of uh, uh, Louisville expected to go in. That's a defensive tackle as well. He's 315 or so uh, pounds as well. So, look, a lot of different guys possibility uh, here in as it relates to the portal. We'll talk a little bit more about – that I, I want to add this uh, real quick. I haven't heard much with Big Cam Williams this spring. Is that a good thing? This is from Garrett Smith. Good thing in y'all's opinion? Yeah. I've heard, I, 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 it's kind of weird because I will say this. I've heard enough to make me feel confident that he's going to be a good player for Texas. Right. Um, I haven't heard a lot, though, to his point, right? Like it's not been an overwhelming yeah, but to that point, I think it's actually kind of good. Like he's not standing out or sticking out like a sore thumb in a bad way. Right. Right. Um, offensive linemen aren't often the guys that get a lot of credit, a lot of a lot of plaudits, by the way. They actually get talked about when they're not doing their job. So maybe maybe that's where where things stand uh, at this point. Hey, guys, I don't know if any of y'all got a chance to do this. Watch some uh, LJ said he watched some other spring games. Bama defensively has issues. Arkansas talent everywhere was really bad. Florida <laughs> might be sneaky. LSU Nussmeyer was impressive, but still major issues everywhere on defense. I'm going to add one more for you guys. Uh, Ohio State, they've got some dudes on defense. Mm -hmm. I'm just, oh, I well, I think this one's different. <laughs> uh, this. If I had to say right now who the odds-on favorite is for a national championship based on what I – because I saw a little bit of their spring game, I would pick up 
Ohio State if as long as Will Howard doesn't throw it to the other team four times in a game. Yeah. Especially with Michigan. Yeah. No, they're going to remind – I'm with you on that. Like, I will spill the pill, Howard, if he wins the starting quarterback job. Like, they are they, – they almost seem like a perfect roster, but they have a, a Shakespearean flaw, a, maybe a tragic one. And I like Will Howard, but Will Howard can have really bad games, really bad half, really bad quarters. And, you know, and I think that ultimately can end up, you know, leading to their downfall. But I – I'm with you on that. I mean, it's, Jim knows one of the best defensive coordinators in the country. Uh, and now he's got that – what's the Bama safety? The Burton that they added? Uh, what's his name? Oh, oh Caleb, Caleb Downs. Caleb Downs. Who was the best Downs. freshman in college football last year? Yeah. So you're talking about a guy that specializes in running that three-high safety defense you added, as Jerry mentioned, one of the best safeties in the country. Yeah. I, I could I could see Ohio State's defense being legit. There ain't no doubt. They always well, they got edge rusher. They keep edge rushers, man. They stockpile them. Uh, it's not just the edge rush. You know what it is, Rod? They are just healthy up front. All four spots on their defensive line. They can they can get after you. They can stop the run. Reminds me a little bit, honestly, of what Michigan played with last year. That's Same good. type of – you know what I mean by that? Same type That's of guys. Yeah. Maybe not as good on the interior as Michigan was, but still plenty good, like first-round good. Yeah. So – uh, that's where that's at. All right, I got time for one more question. Uh, thanks again to our sponsor, Joe Brown, uh, veteran mortgage broker, 512-663-4744. That's 512-663-4744. Uh, if you've been if you're looking for a mortgage broker, give J Joe a call. He's been doing this for 30 plus years. It's the largest purchase you may ever make. You want to have someone you can trust. Uh, that's Joe Brown, 512-663-4744. He is your veteran mortgage professional, Navy veteran, as well as a dual degree at the University of Texas. All right, the last one from Ski Breck here, guys. Does Texas make the SEC championship game? Man, they're asking it before we hear about what happens to the portal. Talk. I Talk mean, look, they're that. one of the two favorites. Mm. Betting favorites pretty heavily. Yep. Yeah, it's them in Georgia. They, I I think I I think they are uh, they they should be the favorite to to make the SEC title game. They should be playing Georgia twice. They should play them in the regular season. And they should play them again in the SEC title game. That's how the the season should work out. Now, if something crazy happens on the east side with Georgia, I don't know, but on the side with Texas, Texas should be coming out as the the West champion. And, and remember when the SEC schedules were first released and. And the initial reaction was, oh, man, that's a tough schedule. If you look around, it's really not. It's, not it's a favorable either. first year in the SEC schedule. Now, part of that is because Florida hasn't really turned the corner under Napier. And they have good players. Don't get me wrong. They're but down. they haven't turned the corner under Billy Napier. And now they have a brutal schedule before they ever get to Austin. But that schedule doesn't look as daunting as it did when it was first released, especially – when you look at what other people have to play. I mean, look, you don't have Alabama. You don't have Ole Miss. You don't have Tennessee on your schedule. And you don't have yep. LSU. Yep. I mean, Arkansas mm, going to have a coaching change, right? Florida could have a coaching change. Mississippi State, first-year coach. They have good – they have big – they have large humans, but do they have – are they quite what they were under Dan Mullen? No. Um, so you just look around. Kentucky lost a lot. Really good D-lineman. Uh, Barry and Brown's a threat. They got a number two receiver out of the portal. That new quarterback, new running back. I mean, coach that was on a plane to and m and the AM sent him back home. I mean, a lot going on there. Um, so I mean, that schedule's not as daunting as it could be. I'll say that. So Texas is a favorite if because they have returned so much, did well in the portal, recruited so well, plus the schedule. It's a favorable yep. schedule. Yep. That's a good point. Your rivals are down. Your rival, not down, but Oklahoma's dealing with a lot of transition. Do new coordinators, new O line, new quarterback. I mean, hell, that's the most important pieces of your team when you're talking about roster construction. And right. then Andy just hired a new coach, so obviously that program is down. I think Jerry's right. I think it's a favorable schedule. There's no doubt about that. I agree with both y'all about it being a favorable schedule. Um, that's why Texas has to take advantage of it. That's right. I mean, when you get opportunities, you better take it. Now, the thing is, they just came out and said they're going to go back to the same schedule in 2025. Yeah, they're just going to flip it, right? Yeah, that's good. Uh, I, I will add this. Hey, Rod, there's no SEC at East and West. Oh, my either. bad. 
So, so I'm old school. No, so this means they're taking the two best schedule, the two You're best. Right. And, and if Texas and Georgia play one another, I could, I, that could not. And Ryan, Ryan Nelson pointed this out. He does a great job on the chats always. Georgia goes to Bama and Ole Miss this year. That's the toughest schedule uh, that they've had in the SEC in a while. That's, I mean, may, and it's because Ole Miss is good, right? Really good this year. Uh, but uh, Georgia's got Georgia's got some tough games. I mean, to, at Bama, at Ole Miss, at Texas, that's a tough road. That is. Yeah. I, I, I think Texas is going to get there if they coalesce as a team. That's the biggest. Like last year, they came together as a team. Yeah. We all agree. I mean, they just had great leadership, in my opinion, and had been through the wars together and, and kind of you just felt it, right? They were all kind of building towards it. Um, I'm waiting to see if this team has that same kind of resolve and that yeah. same kind of cohesiveness. Uh, because I do think if they do add one guy in the portal, at least uh, perhaps two, that they'll have the personnel, which is what everybody's talking about right now, because we don't know if they're going to be as cohesive as they were a year. ago. We hope. Yeah. And also last year, and I, and I think they'll be fine, but remember last year, I mean, this was a hungry group and they were hungry I mean, Texas, you know, they were bringing back the brand. They've talked about how much that meant to them. You know, the disrespect that this is a team that couldn't close, disrespect of even the coaches were hungry, right? This program, they can't develop talent. Um, you know, th th there were all these stigmas that they were trying to, to break, these narratives they were trying to shatter. And they did, by the way. And Sark had his best season as a head coach. Handling success also is something I want to see. It's a challenge, I think, for this group because they've had success now. The expectations are they're going to be great again. And they should have those expectations. But Sark's never been here. And a lot of these guys have never been here. And the program hasn't been here in a long time. So that's I, I want to see how the leadership handles success early on and those expectations. Because they really, there's nobody on the staff. I guess, you know, PK's been in there with Washington. But they haven't been here as a staff really yet. And even Sark, this is something that's unfamiliar to him. This mount, being this close to the mountaintop. Got it. All right. That's going to do it for this Sunday night's uh, live stream. We appreciate you guys. Uh, guys, we had uh, just a ton of people join us. Uh, we appreciate you guys uh, stopping by, uh, listening to the Longhorns on a Sunday evening. Congrats again to Scotty Shefflick. Congrats to the Longhorn baseball team for winning two or three at U of H. Uh, congrats to the Longhorn basketball team uh, for uh, getting two commitments out of the transfer portal today. Uh, last but not least, we're going to leave this up to you. Become an OTF OG. Uh, that's, uh, we've now got a premium website up uh, for ontexasfootball.com. And if you want a $20 gift, uh, gift uh, or not gift, discount, uh, it's normally $59.95. But for $20 off, all you have to use is the coupon code OTF OG. That's OTF OG. And you'll get a subscription for just $39.95 a year. Uh, we're get there each and every day. Myself, Jerry, uh, CJ Vogel, a lot of information about the scrimmage, as well as all the recruits that were on campus this weekend as well. For Rod Babers, Jerry Hamilton, I'm Bobby Burton. That's been this episode of the Longhorn Live Stream. Hook them, guys. <laughs>